Well, good morning. Good morning. Did everybody sleep? Yeah. Sleep is important to health, you know, because all of the damage you do during your waking hours, your body needs you to get offline so it can clean up the mess. Sleep is more than just feeling rested. Sleep is a time of renewal and rejuvenation. So you always need to get sleep. That's why sleep deprivation always tends to erode your health. So if you're not getting a good night's sleep, work on it. Okay, good idea. So listen, we're going to have fun today. I'm going to take you on a little tour, a little trip over time, and a little trip over the psychology of how the, you know, the science of nutrition has evolved and how we've led the way. And I can say that with a great deal of uh, conviction because we've been watching. We've been there doing the work all of these years, and we know how things have progressed, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Okay? Um, let me see if I can get the first slide up. This is... This is my plan, okay, mm -hmm. Neolife at the leading edge. How and why the latest science points to Neolife products being essential for long-term health and vitality. So we've known that for a, for a long time, okay? We've known it all along, matter of fact, that's the, the challenge, the course that we've been on. But it hasn't always been accepted by the medical community. Surprisingly enough, people who are in the, you would think at the forefront of health, are actually at the forefront of disease. They weren't really too worried about health. They were worried about getting rid of the disease that was in your body. And the rest of the story was you were on your own. What they didn't realize is that there's no point in time, whether you are healthy or not healthy, where giving your body the things that it needs becomes unimportant. It doesn't make any sense, does it? How could it, you know, if you think about the basics of uh, things like this, how important is it that you breathe? Okay, pretty important, right? I mean, it doesn't take long without oxygen for you to figure out that I better make sure there's oxygen. So there's no point in time where that simple thing, oh, um, isn't important. How long, how important is it that you continue to pump your blood? Okay. How important is it that that blood's able to come, to take that oxygen and circulate it around your body? So there's never a point in time when things related to your health and vitality aren't aren't critical, but they just sort of separated those things, and they've come a long way since. I've got to applaud them. They're on the right course now, but uh, we've got a ways to go. So what 30 years of nutrition science has told us about health, protection, and disease prevention? There's These are the five basic principles. Whole food nutrients are the key. You know, we are an, an organism that was created, or however you want to look at it, um, to thrive in the presence of these things that were put before us, okay? And we did a pretty good job because we're here, a little overpopulated maybe at the moment, and a little disease-ridden at the moment, but essentially we did a pretty good job of getting here with the things that were put before us. We have thrived, and um, for the most part survived something that a lot of things haven't survived. There's a lot of you know, dinosaur bones around for reasons, and things like that. So whole food nutrients are the key, that they are biologically essential to Human, they're human natural, human nature. The body demands these things. The program that created how the body works says it's going to work in the presence of these things. So when you take those away, the body is going to be compromised. So they are biologically essential. It's important that we get nutrient density as well as nutrient diversity. Okay, there's a lot of companies that would say, you know, you need 50 milligrams of synthetic beta carotene and it's going to solve all your problems. There's still companies doing that even though that's been proven to be false for decades now. Uh, because it's never about one thing. It's never about one member of the vitamin E family or one member of the vitamin B family or one carotenoid or one polyphenol because it was never intended to be that way. It was intended for the body to use this diversity of things that are out there before us again. And it's the absence of diversity that is as important as the absence of density because there are synergies that go on among nutrients that don't go on otherwise, that compromise um, certain functions. And so from a dietary supplement point of view, it's important that whatever you do, fulfill those first four criteria. That means that you've got to do human food chain sourcing. You've got to look at what's supposed to be in the food chain, and you've got to figure out a way to deliver that, because that's where the gaps are. That's where the problems are. What's driving the chronic disease epidemic is two things an excess of the things that you don't need and a, an absence of the things that you do. And all you can do is affect that balance, right? You can only affect that balance. And the more you affect that balance in a positive way, 
the higher the probability that you will live a long and healthy life. And the more you affect that balance in a negative way, increase the probability that you won't. Pretty simple stuff. There are no alternatives and there are no substitutes. You cannot get these things from pond scum or some off-the-wall thing. You cannot take omega-3 fatty acids and make it from algae. That was never the plan. I mean, you can do that. I mean, you can make just about anything from just about anything if you start disassembling atoms and reassembling them. Right? Molecules, you can, you know, molecular science, we can manufacture just about everything. But just because you've manufactured it doesn't, and it appears to be identical, it isn't going to work. There are no alternatives, there are no substitutes. Now, for years, um, the scientific community didn't believe that. The scientific and medical community said, nah, these things aren't important. Thirty years ago, uh, when we were doing, and even before that, when we were doing research, it was, no, don't, you don't really need those, that's just, you're wasting your money, you're making expensive urine, whatever their sort of story was. And really, the story was based on no evidence, just they didn't want to be confused, have you be confused by the fact they wanted you to take this drug or perform this surgery and end of story, don't worry about it. I'm the doctor, I'm in charge, don't worry about it. What's happened over the years, though, is people have gotten more smart. My doctors are my partners. Okay? They're part of my team. It's my team. So my cardiologist, we're on the same team, and he knows he's my teammate because I often ask him questions that often he can't answer. <laughs> and I say, well, here, I just, here, read this. Uh, and the same thing with my GP and the same thing with all of the people that I go around and see from time to time. I have a gastroenterologist friend, uh, and they're all on my team. But... I'm in charge. The reason I'm in charge is because I have informed and empowered myself, and I'm not the type of person who just gives themselves up to stuff. Okay. Uh, some people, that's fine. If you're so intimidated by whatever's going on in your body that you need to be taken care of, fine. Okay. But realize that when you, if you don't ask questions and you don't educate and empower yourself, you are uh, going to have trouble. So over the years, though, even though 30 years ago all of these major scientific communities and medical organizations said, ah, this is nothing, they've come a long ways, okay? And I'll give you a couple of examples. Here's, oh, wait a minute. I leave too far ahead. Oh, no, 30 years. Okay, I went back to the 1980s. And I wanted to focus on these five things, okay? In the beginning, 1980s, Neolife was the first to see that whole food, plant-derived protective nutrients, carotenoids, polyphenols, so, and to this day, we're still probably the only company out there that has the scientific prowess and the understanding to point to these things and say, not only do we know these are effective, but they're in our products, and the products have been tested and proven effective. Right? So the medical community has come a long way from going from useless to unimportant. Here's what they're saying today. I like using this slide here. I have no pointer, so I can't point, because that's not a screen. That's a flat panel. But if you look here, what it says, this is from Stanford's Nutrition Service for Cancer Patients. Used to be Stanford said when you came in and you had cancer, stop everything. Don't take any vitamins. Don't eat anything. Don't, 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 don't. We're going to give you chemotherapy. We're going to do surgery. We're going to give you chemotherapy. We're going to give you radiation. Don't do anything. Don't take any dietary supplements. Don't worry about your nutrition. Wow. It doesn't make sense when you think about it, does it? So, but now, here's what they do. If you go into Stanford, and you can go to their site and read this, and they'll go and tell you about colon cancer and breast cancer and la di da di da di da I'm getting more specific, but it says, if you see right up at the top here, you probably can't read it, I'll read it to you, where it says phytochemicals, phytonutrients, is part of a cancer diet. Hmm, your cancer diet, can you imagine that? It says phytochemicals are chemicals found in plants and protect plants against bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Eating large amounts of brightly colored fruits and vegetables, yellow, orange, red, green, white, blue, purple, Whole grain cereals and beans containing phytochemicals may decrease the risk of developing certain cancers as well as diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease. Oh, so they're actually saying that these things are protective. The reason they put the may in and you talk to them is because they don't know how you're going to behave. They don't know how much you're going to get. You know, if you actually eat one kernel of whole grain a day, that isn't going to be enough. They say may because they can't control behavior. But they know that if people behave properly and consume a lot of these things, it's going to be um, beneficial for them. But if you go look at what they're saying here, they're, they're going to take you on a walk through our product catalog right now. Okay, they start with allicin. You know what allicin is, right? Garlic allium complex. 
and then they go right to anthocyanins, those are part of the polyphenol family. And then they go to bioflavonoids, those would be part of the flavonoid family. You find those in not only in flavonoids, but in our vitamin C products and so on and so forth. Then they go to carotenoids, you know where those are, right? And then flavonoids and then indoles, indole carbonyl, that would be in cruciferous. Um, isoflavones, that would be in our protein supplements, soy protein and cruciferous as well. Lignans are in our fiber products. Okay, lutein, that's one of the carotenoids that would be a carotenoid complex. Lycopene is another one. Phenolics, we talked about phenolics last night, polyphenols. So essentially, they just took you through a big chunk of our product line. And they said, and then they give you a list of foods, and then they take you through the sources. They don't say you can go buy these supplements from GNC or anyplace else. They tell you foods. And when you look at that list of foods, that's where we go to. They send you to the same foods that we've been going to for years to get these bioactive substances. Because what other choice do you have? Where else would they be? You know, I mean, you can't, uh, you can't get them anyplace else. It's pretty simple when you think about it. It's when they become absent that the problem comes along. So that's, so that's Stanford. Stanford's just one. Let's take a, what does John Hopkins have to say? Well, this one deals with colorectal cancer. It says, eating to fight and prevent colorectal cancer. Whoa, wait a minute. Johns Hopkins thinks I can eat certain things and prevent colorectal cancer? Ta-da, welcome to the 1980s. <laughs> I, I, I hate to be like that, but, come, you know, I've sat in front of these people for long periods of time saying, come on, it doesn't make any sense. Think about it. Work it through. We're, and they're so focused on treating the cancer that they didn't even understand how to get a bigger view of things. They get down here. It's like, you know, they get to learn more and more about less and less. Okay? And they get so hyper-focused that the real world and all that goes on around it, this doesn't make any sense. But look what they're saying. They're saying, eat plenty of brightly colored fruits and vegetables, first thing on the list. Okay. <laughs> eat fresh fish, oh, omega-3s, okay, got that. Uh, limit consumption of red meat, okay, got that. Avoid excess and saturated fats, oh, we got that too. We have low fat. Maintain a healthy weight, we can help you with that. Uh, sleep, I mentioned sleep earlier, you know, maintain healthy weight and keep physically active. Uh, limit alcohol consumption and avoid tobacco. And look at the things that they're saying that you should consume. You can see in the pictures, when you look behind in the pages that follow in their website, they go deep into, you know, the role of lycopene and the role of antioxidants and so on and so forth. But the, the thing about this is, these are current today, right off of the website a couple of days ago. The thing about this is that these are folks that used to say, nah, when we would go out, or you would go out and talk to your doctors, and you'd say, nah, carotenoids, nah, omega-3s, nah, don't worry about it. B vitamins, no, don't take those. There's even practitioners still today that say, um, I don't want you taking any vitamins. You can go to them and say, I've got some supplements I want to take. Now, don't take any vitamins. Okay. What they don't realize is that there's a whole lot more to nutrition than just vitamins, and that what you're presenting to them are not just vitamins. Okay? That's why I ask people when they get into these situations, ask your physician, when they say, don't take supplements, you should say, well, should I, should I eat fish? <laughs> well, yeah, of course, fish is good, yeah. Okay, okay so, because of the omega-3s, right? Yeah, okay, good. Well, should I eat carrots and tomatoes? And, well, yeah, you should do that, because of the carotenoids. Oh, yeah, those are they, but they, they don't equate the idea that the vitamin industry is a lot bigger than just the vitamins that were present back in 1970. Because okay, what they did is they wrote the book that they learned from in 1970, and they're still learning from it today. Right. It's hard. It's expensive to republish books. But, and it's so dynamic. How do, if I print it today, it'll be obsolete tomorrow. So, but the, the point of the matter is that a couple of things you need to realize. You are not in the vitamin business, okay? That's a small portion of the product line. You are in the nutrition and health business on a much grander scale, okay? So when you talk to people and they say, I don't need any vitamins, well, that isn't what I'm talking to you about. Okay, I got vitamins if you want them, but that's not what I'm talking They're still essential, but that's not what I'm talking about. The presence or absence of vitamins, those things, are not what's driving the chronic disease epidemic. It's the presence or absence of omega-3s and carotenoids and flavonoids and the foods that they contain. And we all know that even when we try, we can't get enough. And then topping it off with 
whole food dietary supplements is the key. So, pretty cool. Now, today we find that essentially, essentially every major health protection and disease prevention authority now embraces the importance of whole food bioactive nutrients in maximizing health, minimizing disease, and providing complementary treatment to certain diseases and conditions. I say complementary treatment because now if you go in for uh, cancer, they're going to try to get you to focus on making sure your nutrition is good. Those people are saying, well, you need to have these colorful fruits and vegetables. So they see that as complementary. Um, it's, we've known this again for a long time that these things play complementary roles. Dr. First knew that years and years ago, that you can't separate the, the creature from the things that it needs, even when it's being treated with chemotherapy or whatever, you still have to give the creature the things it needs. The creature would be us. Right? So all of these, essentially every one of them. I just put these up here because we interact with these people quite a lot and we spend a lot of time looking at their databases and evidence and so on. So, so I, what I want to do now is I want to go back to um, this one here. And I want to focus on just three things that are in here. And I want to do this as a mechanism of sort of going beyond the idea that they say carotenoids and we say carotenoids and how did they get here, how did we get here, but how did they get here and often they got here by paying attention to our research, finally, ours and other people. So this is going to get a little overwhelming for you, I'm going to leave these things behind. It's, I, I have a, a, a real problem telling people half an answer, okay, uh, and uh, you know that I'm actually known to be a little lengthy in some of my answers simply because until I give you everything that I think you need in order to be empowered to not only apply it to yourself but to help others then I don't feel that my job is done. You know, information is one thing but knowledge is power but knowledge isn't powerful until you've given it to somebody who can use it. Okay? Otherwise it just goes in a file cabinet and everybody goes oh. You know, and it doesn't become part of the psyche of health, right? It doesn't become part of the thing that people understand automatically. So I want to focus on three things that were in the, in the Stanford site. Right? I'm going to talk carotenoids, isoflavones, and uh, phenolics. And I want to relate them to our products, okay? You know, we've been doing carotenoids for a long time. We started working on them in the 1980s and we actually brought carotenoid complex to market in 92. And, you know, got it so much attention that the New York Academy of Sciences and others got involved, and the USDA got involved, and we did all this wonderful research. But I'm not going to tell you about that. You all know that. This is what I'm going to take you on. I'm going to take you on a little tour. Okay. This is carotenoid complex, right? whole food, human nutrition. Those are the things that it's made from. Carrots, tomatoes, spinach, red bell peppers, peaches, strawberries, and apricots. Okay. You need to know that. You should be able to say that because it's cool. <laughs> it's like 12 beef patty special sauce so the cheese pickles onions on the sesame seed bun and you know how far they got with that message <laughs> they got all over the planet and killed half of them no. <laughs> I don't care that's not really fair it's maybe only 40% <laughs> um, so these things are key and it's a way of you know, all of those things are your friends. People know when you say, well, you know, I wanted to talk to you about their spinach, red bell peppers, peaches, strawberries, and apricots. People don't become too intimidated by them, especially if you say non-GMO. Okay. So, um, carotenoid complex. I talk about density and diversity, you know, when nature provided them. Nature didn't provide one like beta carotene or one like lycopene or one like lutein. And if you go around the marketplace, people say, well, you need... This, I've got OcuSave, I'm going to save your vision, and I've got lutein. It didn't even come from things that we eat, but I've got lutein, right? And it's going to save your vision. No, it's not. Because if you start digging into what causes the vision to go away, certainly lutein is part of the problem, part of the solution. But lutein and zeaxanthin together, because that's the way they're found in food, in conjunction with, you know, alpha cryptoxanthin and a few others that have the synergy that actually do this, well, along with some omega-3s. That's the key to... to preserving your vision. So diversity is important. So when we did this, we actually said, what's there? Let's take it all. We're piggies, right? We want to deliver all of these nutrients. So those are the 15 that are there. And these 15 are what drives the ship. Okay, There are some others, but these are the 15 that drive the ship. And let me show you what that means. Here we go. 
This is going to be quick. Okay, see they're underlined alpha carotene, beta carotene, lutein, lycopene. If you go up to the top, it says intake of specific carotenoids and the risk of lung cancer. It says down there that there was a 63% lower incidence of lung cancer was observed when these things were present in the diet. Hmm, pretty serious. Okay, that was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Here's stuff from alpha carotene, beta carotene, beta carotene. Now there's six of these, seven of these together. You can see that. The one up there says higher intakes of carotenoids, alpha, beta, carotene, cryptozoan, that, 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 reduce the risk of epithelial ovarian cancer, okay? And, and this continues to go on. The next one says lowers the risk of breast cancer from a, a group of beta lycopene, beta, carotene, and beta, cryptozantin. These things work together, and if they're not together, you don't get the benefit. Here's serum alpha carotenoids, alpha carotene, and the risk of cardio or CBD, cardiovascular, inversely associated with death from all causes. So you want to get a lot of alpha carotene in your diet if you don't want to die from all causes, but including cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all causes other than cardiovascular disease and cancer. So the, just the presence of this carotenoid marker in there includes that. The next one is in food reviews, increase the intake of capsanthin, rich foods can help for disease prevention. We don't have any competitors out there that are uh, delivering capsanthin in their product. It's not easy to do, it's not easy to find, and you can't get it the cheap and dirty way, so, but it's there for us because it belongs in those sorts of foods. So many reviews in medicinal chemistry, medicinal chemistry is the chemistry of, of, of medicine. It's higher circulating levels of alpha cryptoxanthin. You ever hear of alpha cryptoxanthin? Isn't that a great word? <laughs> Hyphenated alpha cryptoxanthin. Okay. Alpha carotene, trans beta carotene. Did you know there was a trans beta carotene? There is. Lutein, zeaxanthin, and cis-lycopene. Did you know there was a cis-lycopene? There is. Contribute to lower prostate cancer risk. Okay, so the presence of that group together, lower prostate cancer risk. They're all in our product. Nutrition and cancer here says higher circulating levels of alpha cryptoxanthin, alpha carotene, trans, beta carotene, and lutein and zeaxanthin may contribute to lower prostate cancer risk. Here's one here that talks about beta cryptoxanthin. There's not very many competitors out there who know how to deliver that product. Can uh, reduce oxidative stress and uh, protect from DNA damage and squamish metaplasia, squamish cell things going on in your in your lung and your skin. From the from the the journal Carcinogenesis, it says apparent cancer preventive effects of dietary carotenoids may depend on enhanced DNA repair. You know we got DNA damage going on all the times in our body, and there are certain nutrients that actually defend it in the first place, but there's another group that actually repair it when it gets damaged. And what they're saying is that the presence of this carotenoids actually helps make sure that those things get uh, uh, repaired properly. Here's one from Food Science. It's a potent agent against neurodegenerative disorders. Neurodegenerative disorders are neuropathies and uh, cognition type things and Parkinson's and ALS and so on and so forth. And there's a great deal of evidence that supports all of these. Here's some more. Association of Maternal Serum Carotenoid Antioxidants and Asthma in Children demonstrated that maternal serum levels of alpha carotene, beta carotene, and beta cryptoxanthin reduce the risk of asthma in children. Hmm. Pretty cool, huh? Makes sense when you think about it because the, the child, the fetus, has no source of these other than mama. And if mama doesn't have enough, guess what? Okay, fetus won't have enough. And there are always implications associated, especially during the reproductive periods, of the concept of not enough. Okay? Because not enough somehow comp says it compromises the system. So in this particular case, one of the Im indicators for asthma risk is the presence of those three carotenoids, which you're not going to get from other people's carotenoid supplements. You'll only get them either from the foods that contain those or from from our stuff here. Here's the American Journal of Epidemiology Association of Antioxidants and Cognition and Nurses Health Study. It says that analysis of overall cognitive status of older age, okay, that probably me too, results in uh, for vitamin E, C, and are generally null. So vitamin E and C are generally null, but higher carotenoid intake was related with better cognition. So if you think about it, we thought that you know vitamins play a role in that, and they, it's not that they don't. It's just that it, it's too many variables in there for them to make conclusions. But they do conclude that higher carotenoid intake is related to better cognition in these older nurses. So if you know any older nurses, if you know any younger nurses, they should start taking it now so when they're older nurses they can 
experience the benefit, then the older nurses can start anytime they want. <laughs> Here's that from a European deal. Low, low serum lycopene and beta carotene increase the risk of acute myocardial infarction in men. What that says, guys, is if you're not getting these things, your probability of having a heart attack, a serious one, are much greater. This is results of this thing here, and it goes down and says, uh, essentially, what do you need? Well, in the highest tertiary, you need lycopene and beta carotene. And I don't know if you know how to read statistical analysis or not, uh, but uh, those things are really serious improvements, 55, 60% reduction in probability of risk. Here's another one, cancer prevention, beta cryptoxanthin restores nicotine-induced lung SRT to normal levels and inhibits nicotine-promoted lung tumorigenesis, the creation of tumors, and emphysema. This is a mice study. It's hard to induce emphysema in human patients to study them. There's an ethics issue there. <laughs> so, how would you like to come in? We'll give you emphysema, and then we'll see if we can fix it for you. Maybe you don't get to do that. So what they point to here is this BCX, Beta cryptoxanthin supplementation increased survival probability, and beta cryptoxanthin is a preventing agent against emphysema and lung cancer. We see that data in the epidemiology, where you're studying populations and seeing who gets emphysema and who doesn't, and what their diet's like, and what it's got and what it doesn't have. Uh, in this particular case, though, they just demonstrated a direct relationship between beta cryptoxanthin and that process. Here's one from high serum carotenoids associated with lower risk of bone loss and osteoporosis. Makes you think that carotenoids are important for everything, aren't they? <laughs> they are, okay? They are important for everything. They play roles everywhere in your body where there are cells. Okay. Pretty simple. <laughs> This goes on to say, antioxidant carotenoids, especially beta cryptoxanthin and beta carotene, are inversely associated with a change in radial BMD, bone mass density, or bone mineral density in postmenopausal females. They're inversely associated means when carotenoids are high, the risk is low, and conversely, when carotenoids are low, the risk is high. That's, they like to use inverse because it's a cool word. <laughs> Annals of neurology, intakes of vitamin C and carotenoids, and the risk of ALS. It says a high intake of carotenoid compounds may help prevent or delay the onset of ALS, according to Harvard researchers. Greater total carotenoid intake was linked to reduced risk of ALS. Now, if you think about it, the ALS is one of the probably the most horrific ways to not survive for your time here on the planet because of the way it progresses. Um, Yet now we know that there are processes where you can actually prevent that from occurring. And if it starts to occur, delay the, the rate at which it progresses, which will keep you around longer. You're going to find here pretty soon that the medical community is going to come out with some things and they're going to say, we think we found a way to treat it. And the way they're finding the way to treat it is by looking into the cells and how they interact with these nutrients. And then they're going to come up with drugs that amplify that relationship which is fine for people who are down the path and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a pretty practical guy. I like to use every tool in the box, you know, so I don't use pliers on head bolts on my Corvette because it doesn't make sense and I've got a torque wrench. So, you know, <laughs> there are times when you need a torque wrench and there are times when pliers are just fine. So you've got to think of that context of that. There are times when nutrition and all of this stuff is great, but there are times when a little medical intervention might be appropriate. Like if you've got a broken arm, have them set it. If you want some pain relief, get some pain relief. So anyway, this is really important because it's sort of one of the big elusive challenges of, the, of our ability to try to understand what happens to people with disease and how we get to help them. Now we know that uh, if you don't want to get ALS, you might want to just not worry about whether you're going to get it and get on with carotenoids. Here's some a little more contemporary stuff. That's, uh, goes back a little ways. This is from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Women with higher circulating carotenoid levels are at a reduced risk of breast cancer. Okay. Uh, carotenoids inhibit tumor progression and reduce proliferation of estrogen receptor positive. So uh, again, there's this idea of getting cancer, carcinogenesis itself. So the carotenoids actually reduce that, that, that if those events from happening. Reduce them, though. It's not eliminating them because it's a really biologically active tissue. So the advantage is that it reduces them, but should a carcinogenesis occur, 
it slows the progression. So let's say that a woman who is 65 years old has this event take place. Okay. And rather than succumbing in the usual five to eight year survival window that you'd expect for a person of that age, that it slows the progression and they die at 88 years old with breast cancer but not from it. Okay. That's what that sort of thing means. So eventually, you know, all of the guys here are going to die with some prostate cancer. It's just the law. Okay, we got a prostate, and, you know, it's one of the prices we pay for being guys. Uh, but the reality is that it's encapsulated there in the prostate, and within reason, if you haven't, if you don't die from prostate cancer, if you die from something else, if they were to cut out your prostate, they would find some cancer there, just because of the nature of the organ. Same thing applies throughout the body. You know, there's the body's exposed to these things, but with the right sort of nutrients and the right sort of protection, they don't have to be the things that take you to the grave. Okay? You can die in a skiing accident at 100 years old, or whatever you want to do. Okay, so, um, total and individual. Hmm, oh, there you go. Total, individual and total carotenoids. So they're saying individually, what I was saying earlier, that certain carotenoids play direct roles, but total, meaning in synergy, are associated with this benefit. Okay. Uh, this is from the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Plasma carotenoids and reduce free recurrence of free survival, recurrence free survival of women in, with a history of breast cancer. Again, significantly reduce the risk of breast cancer returning. A lot of a lot of people go through the breast cancer process. What do I do? I'm scared. The doctors haven't told me anything. They just want me to come back for to be checked from time to time. Well, there are things that you can do. The probability of recurrence here is diminished with this. That's true of also soy flavonoids, right? Or soy isopal bones, soy proteins. The, now we know that there's a reduced risk associated with those things. So combination of things. Here's another one. This came off the wire just step, step, 7 September 2018. I thought it was interesting because it shows how they continue to progress down the same path that we've been going down, carotenoids, vitamin A, and, and their association with metabolic syndrome. You know what med -S is, right? It's that sort of thing that the mass of the population is suffering from. You're overweight, uh, you've got trouble with your, with your blood lipids, and so on and so forth, and uh, you're on a path to heart disease and diabetes. So those are essentially, all of those people that are on that pathway are suffering from uh, metabolic syndrome. It says, modifiable factors that reduce the burden of metabolic syndrome, particularly plant-derived biomarkers, that's what carotenoids and flavonoids and the like are, the systemic review from PRISM uh, evaluates evidence from a period of 20 years. Goes on to say in the results, the association was the strongest for beta carotene. The results were an inverse relationship for carotenoids and med -S. High carotenoids meant low med -S -S risk. Low carotenoids meant high med -S risk. The association was strongest for beta carotene followed by alpha carotene and beta cryptoxanthin. Again, people who give you a supplement that has only beta carotene in it isn't going to get the job done. I mean, it's going to get part of the job done, but it isn't going to get the whole job done. And conclusion here says, this review and meta-analysis suggests that unlike retinol, vitamin A, total and individual carotenoids are inversely related to metabolic, 34% reduction of risk of metabolic syndrome. Now again, total and individual. Okay. So now let's take a look at this. Remember the other one on there was isoflavones, right? And then soy isoflavones and the isoflavones that they're talking about are present in our soy proteins and in our cruciferous plus. So let's take a look at these things. Are soy proteins and isoflavones protective? I think some of you may have seen this slide before. I've used it from time to time. But basically, uh, my graph got a little messed up. But it says soy consumption by region. So you can take a look at North America, less than one gram a day. <coughs> Northwestern Europe, less than one gram. China, 3.4. Indonesia, 7.4 grams of these things a day. Korea, 6.2 to 9.6, and Japan, uh, 8.7. And then over here, you see the occurrence of breast cancer. So at the top of the pile there, the highest ones, is the United States. Right? So we have the lowest intake of these things and the highest incidence of breast cancer. Okay? And as you go down the list, you find that those with the lowest incidence, I can't use my pointer, those with the lowest down here have the lowest incidence. Now, we've known this for a while. We've been saying, hey, you know, all of these people have been saying, oh, soy causes breast cancer, soy does this or that. No, because the evidence doesn't tell you that. That's a nice sort of thing for you to say to sort of mislead people into thinking that there's a, a dragon that needs to be slain here. But the evidence doesn't support that. The evidence says when soy proteins 
in soy iso and the isoflavones that are associated with them and the ones that are in cruciferous vegetables are present in uh, the diet. The incidence of breast cancer is dramatically reduced. Okay. Pretty straightforward. And it makes sense when you think of it in that context. So soy has always been vilified. I'll do a quick little story here because I think that for a long time the medical community was saying stupid stuff. Okay. And I say stupid stuff because they would ignore the evidence and being an evidence-sensitive, evidence-driven practice, you know, medicine. You never ignore the evidence. You can say, well, I don't necessarily give it all the weight, but you can never ignore the evidence, and that evidence has been around for a while. So now it says that the American Cancer uh, Society says soy is fine. There's no evidence of medical literature that soy protein isolate is bad for humans as compared to other forms of soy, and soy protein isolate is often used in supplements, randomized studies on health effects of soy health, and none of these studies have ever shown any harm. So if they come out and say, oh, these things are harm, they cause you to have breast cancer, or they cause all these problems, no, there's never been a study that showed that. It was speculation in the internet by people who like to get in the internet and speculate. Right? I got a website, I got credentials, or the appearance of credentials, and I'm going to say something controversial because that'll get people's attention, and then I'm going to offer them this thing over here because I make a lot of money on it. Okay. Doesn't work. Um, here's one from MD Anderson. MD Anderson used to say, don't consume soy, and then they said, well, maybe it's okay, and now they say, we have gone from, this is them, we have gone from saying no soy for breast cancer survivors to it's going to be, it's not going to hurt. Scruggs, the lady from MD Anderson, and says, now it looks like we can say it may help. Okay. That's a complete turn. You know how big an issue it is to get somebody like MD Anderson to say we were wrong? That's what they said. They said it in a nice, elegant statement. Oh, you know, wrap it up. And the lady that presented it was really nice and had a great smile. And, you know, you felt good just being in her presence. But basically they said we were wrong. We were way wrong. We were saying you should avoid these things, and actually you should have been embracing them. We were way wrong, okay? yeah, which is okay. It's nice of them to admit it. But those are, those are and this is the National Cancer Institute event that took place. Okay? Here's the Journal of the American Medical Association. says women with breast cancer, er, women with breast cancer who eat more soy are less likely to die. Ooh, <laughs> that's important. I don't want to die. Or have a recurrence of cancer from women who eat few or no, no soy products. So women who aren't eating any soy are at higher risk of dying from breast cancer, the recurrence of breast cancer, than women who eat a bunch. Basically they're saying if you want to reduce the occurrence, recurrence of breast cancer, eat a bunch of soy. They just looked at the other side. said when it's absent, the risk goes up. This was December 2012. Uh, Linus Pauling Institute, currently available data suggests that breast cancer survivors should not be further discouraged from consuming soy foods in moderation, goes on to talk about a 25% reduced risk of tumor recurrence in breast cancer survivors. Okay, so they're coming along. Stanford said soy is an excellent source of protein fiber, da, 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 da. so they probably embrace this, and then they throw in a little thing for the guys, who said certain soy proteins common in the Asian diet have been shown to inhibit prostate cell cancer growth. So guys, there you go. It isn't going to feminize you. It isn't going to make you produce more estrogen than you would have normally. You're not going to go from talking like this to talking like this. <laughs> Any of those things that these folks were out there telling you, they were telling people that. People were going around telling people those stories. Come on. There was no evidence. So what they were doing is they were speculating about speculators who were speculating about speculating. And the whole speculation was based on the idea of maybe I can sell something. Um, there, there are groups in the internet that still try to tell you these stories. Okay? You just have to be aware that their motivations, though their, their motivations may be grounded in something they think is important, they're not. Okay? It's not grounded in science. And the difference between us is I could tell you all sorts of things I think are important, but that's not the way we work. We come to you with all the evidence. We say, we think these are important, but don't believe us. Look at all this evidence, okay? And that's why we've been doing this for decades and why all these folks are coming on the boat with us these days. So here's one here. Soy, soy proteins and isoflavones help protection disease prevention. Soy foods, isoflavones, and postmenopausal women. This is a fairly recent study that goes on to talk about, I can't use my pointer again, conclusion, although concerns have been raised about soy food consumption may be harmful to breast cancer protein, 
analysis of 9,514 9, breast cancer survivors who were followed for 7.4 years found that higher um, post-diagnosis soy intake was associated with a 25% reduction of risk again. So this is a, a more recent study than that early one. So ladies, if you have friends who, or you yourself, have experienced um, breast cancer, consuming soy proteins is great, consuming carotenoids is great. Remember there was association there. There's an association with omega-3s, and it's because all of these things are fundamental to how that tissue remains healthy. Soy proteins and isoflavones. Here's do soy proteins improve cognitive function in postmenopausal women? <gasps> okay, everybody knows that at one point in time, you guys are all going to go over the edge. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're going to go through this thing of menopause, which is, you know, it's just nature's way of taking care of it. They say, okay, you're done being the reproductive organ here in the thing, and we're going to give you a little chill. But that chill often comes with hot, cold, hot, cold. But anyway, do they play a role? Then you want to stay sharp. And what we know is that once women go postmenopausal, the probability of dementia goes up pretty dramatically, cognitive dysfunction. So in this particular study, they did a meta-analysis of 10 placebo-controlled random uh, studies of soy isoflavone supplementation of 1,024 patients. And they found that it was a significantly re uh, reduction of risk of uh, dysfunction. The conclusion is that soy isoflavone supplementation seems to have a positive effect on improving summary cognitive function and visual memory in postmenopausal women. Now, the last thing the guys want is for women to be better at remembering things, right? Because <laughs> we are just, you know, it's in my rearview mirror, I'm not going to worry about it. Right? <laughs> My wife will say something like, you remember when we went to that party and you wore that, wore that stupid yellow tie? No. <laughs> was that important? Well, it wasn't to me, but it was to her. So, you know, really what we're going to do is we're setting ourselves up for a lot of issues later in life. But that's okay. Um, so this sort of su summary cognitive function, it means everything that goes on in the brain as well as visual memory. So these are strong associations that you, that you don't see. This is more modern in the sense that the rest of the medical community hasn't come to this yet. If you go to your, if, if you're going to a doctor to be treated for your menopause or managed for menopause, they're probably not going to tell you this now. They will in a few years, but they're not going to tell you this now, but you can share it with them. Let's talk about whole food polyphenols. I talked about this last night a little bit. I want to go through... There are more than just tray to our whole food polyphenol deal. This is the deal tray plus glucose balance and cruciferous and flavonoids and tea. Okay? This is the whole food polyphenol family. This is why we have all these products. Okay? If you look here, glucose balance, see the yellow? This is, without a pointer, this is going to get hard. But where these yellow ovals are, those are the bioactive flat, uh, polyphenols in glucose balance that provide the benefits that are associated with those ingredients, the, the cinnamon and the curcumin and the, and the like. And they've got these really funny names like diphenylethylmethane. Who knew that something with the word methane on the end would be good for you, but it is. But those are the active ingredients, the phenolic acids and so on. The purple one for Trey here has still being, see that, per and see this long oval here, and the, the one down on the end here, rather the one down on the end, that's the things that Trey has, is that group. And then flavonoids, or the, the, the T is the pink one, but flavonoid complex is that big purple one that covers that broad spectrum. So the goal here, when you look at all of these things and you see them in the food supply, there's not one simple way to deliver them all. It would be a really big tablet. Okay. And some of them don't even lend themselves to being tablets. They prefer to stay in their natural liquid state, which is why we have things like tray. But this is the group of things. You see the flavonoid complex? Has, see those flavones down? Flavones, flavanols, flavanol, flavanols, flavanols, Those are the family of flavonoids. That is the biggest group of the polyphenol family and where we started the research program years and years ago. But it took us back into this bigger group of polyphenols called called the, uh, the phenolic compounds in the diet. So really, really important. So let's see what's going on with these things. What do we know? Well, last night I said polyphenols, health protection and disease prevention. It's another one of these inverse relationships. When they are low in the diet, the risk of disease is high. And conversely, when they are high in the diet, the risk of disease is low. 
the pretty basic stuff. That's epidemiology. We see that from the data from millions of people. It's not like they've looked at five people and figured this out. They've looked at millions of people over several decades to get to this data. Okay. Here's some uh, sort of late-breaking news. I showed you this last night. This is Polyphenols Health Protection Disease Prevention. Here's the ways. This little box over here, it's the ways in which they do that. It says plant polyphenols offer protection against the development of, catch this, <laughs> oxidative medicine, right? And cell longevity, stuff we know a lot about. It says diets rich in plant polyphenols offer protection against development of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, and neurodegenerative diseases. Notice they didn't say may or could or might. They said they do. Because they, we know and they know that they do. To what extent they do is a different you know, sort of issue. For you it might be 50%, for somebody else it might be 35 or it might be 85 but, And then the mechanisms of action over here is this is what they protect you from. Okay? So let's look at some more current data. This is polyphenols diet cancer. Polyphenol trial suggests significant clinical benefit. Uh, Anti-neoplastic event, that's creating new, uh, new cancers. Uh, this study found a significant short-term favorable effect on PSA scores for men, okay? So these polyphenols play a role in helping us with our PSA scores. Here's one from Nutrition, Metabolism, and Cardiovascular Disease, an inverse association between polyphenol intake and the occurrence of cardiovascular events. A 46% reduction in risk of cardiovascular events was observed from making sure these are here, and the greater intake of polyphenols, especially lignans, flavonoids, and hydroxybenzoic acid. You didn't know that was a flavonoid, did you? For a polyphenol. It sounds like something you don't want, but it's fine. Benzoic acids are fine. Um, decrease the risk. So a 46% reduction in risk, guys. 46% reduction. Pretty, pretty simple. Cardiovascular events, men and women both. Here's one here from American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, habitual intake of anthocyanins. That's one of the flavonoids that's present in, in tray, okay, amongst other things. And flavones and the risk of cardiovascular disease in men goes on that there's a bunch of 19% lower, 22% lower numbers that you see down in there. It says higher intakes of fruit-based flavonoids, not things that they construct in a laboratory or get from some tree, but fruit-based flavonoids were associated with a lower risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction. That means you have a heart attack, but you survive it. It might be wheelchair-bound or whatever, but you survive it. Here's another one, polyphenols, health protection, disease prevention, total polyphenol intake, polyphenol subtypes, Okay, not just the bigger ones, and the incidence of cardiovascular disease, a 47% lower cardiovascular disease risk events, right? Flavonoid intake, that's just the subclass they're talking about. Conclusion, intake of flavonoids showed an inverse association for risk of cardiovascular events in a prospective cohort of Spanish, I love the way they do this, Spanish middle-aged adult university graduates. <laughs> so if you encounter any Spanish middle-aged adult university graduates, <laughs> Well, I'm a Spanish middle-aged adult, but I didn't graduate from university. No, it won't work. I think so. Or I did graduate from university, but I'm not Spanish. It won't work. No, I don't think so. <laughs> it's just, you know, scientists. They want to give you narrow it right down. Here's another one. Polyphenol health protection. Perspective association between total and specific dietary polyphenol intakes. Again, that's the diversity and density idea. Cardiovascular disease risk. These are French people. Uh, and you can see here, depending upon which one it was, you can see those dihydrochalcones, sounds like a Spanish thing, <laughs> proanthocyanidins, dihydroflavanols, and hydroxybenzoic acid. There's that benzoic acid again. Uh, and still beans were associated with a 13, 19, 24, 24, and 27, respectively, um, reduction in cardiovascular disease risk. So individually they do that, and then in concert they all add up to do that as well. Here's another one, polyphenols from nutrients, natural, natural polyphenols, not synthetic ones, not made from junk or garbage, uh, prevent and treatment for cancer. Hmm. It's treating cancer, so this is a complementary thing. Right down at the bottom in the conclusion it says that the vast majority of laboratory studies supported anti-cancer activities for natural polyphenols, such as anthocyanins, EGCG, resveratrol, and curcumin, such as tray and tray and T and tray and <laughs> glucose balance. Okay. That's what they told you. They just used words that 
didn't say that. So um, here's the key, okay? There's a couple of things. I started out saying I want you to see how we stayed at the forefront. The reason we've been at the forefront all these years because we knew this a long time ago. We knew that there didn't make any sense that it would be any other way. Okay. Our com competitors tried to take advantage of the data by offering you non-human food chain things, right? You've heard me talk about Blake's Leah trispora, which is a little asexual fungus that if you treat it just right, it'll turn into beta carotene for you. And then you can say natural beta carotene. So our competitors use that sort of stuff, or, you know, you know, the other Selena, or try to get their omega-3s from kelp, or, come on, you know, what's the point? They're just sort of, they're doing everything they can to not embrace the reality that it needs to come from food. And it needs to be inside the human food chain, that's the way the thing was done, that's the way it's intended, why are you doing this? And the reason is because it's difficult to do it the way we do it, it's more cost-effective for them, because... Who buys algae, right? I mean, you can get some seaweeds in Japan or so on, but these types of algae, there's no inherent market value to them, so they have no cost. So they can take something that has essentially no cost and convert it into something that, in theory, has a lot of value by making you believe it's something that it isn't, okay? They tell it to get you to believe it's natural omega-3s. Yeah, but for who? You know, natural for humans? No. We don't get our omega-3s that way. It was never in the plan for us to get our omega-3s that way. Give me a break. What's about this? Why do they devalue health so much that they would give you something that appears to be something that it isn't? You have to ask yourself those sorts of questions. Where are their heads at? Where are their hearts at when they do that? Okay. It's, a big, it's a big question. They're market-driven. Maybe their philosophy isn't ours. Ours is a little bit different. Ours is you are family. And we are going to do everything we can to maximize your knowledge, to empower you with tools so that you can take care of yourself and help others. Okay. We don't like to say oops. Okay. It's not, it's a four letter word, right? Oops, O O P S, right? It's spoop, help that spelled backwards. Um, <laughs> you know, we don't, that's not something that's in our vocabulary. We take decades getting things to market because it takes that long. Okay. We need to have this level of assurance that other people don't. They run to the market to capture the market, the moment of the market. We bring things to market to help people out. That's the only reason we have. Okay. We have no motivation for it. We could do a lot of things a lot faster and capture the moment of the market, but we would be seeing these things come and go. If you think about the things that have gone on in the last 20 years that have been put up there as being the savior of all humankind for health and disease, there aren't many of them left. And if you look at the stuff that's gone along and the evidence is built up and you see how far the medical community has come and what they're embracing today, what are they embracing? They're embracing the things that we've been talking about. Why are they embracing them? Because there is no alternative. There is no substitute for them. Thank you very much.